This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. This week, we spend the hour in conversation with photographer Mona Kuhn. Kuhn is an internationally recognized art photographer known for her sublime study of the human form. Her work can be found in collections such as LACMA, The Hammer, and The Getty, where she serves as an independent scholar. Our conversation touches on a number of topics around her past, her motivations, and her methodology. At the end of the episode, I'll be taking a look at some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, seeing someone for who they really are with Mona Kuhn. Joining me today on the podcast to talk about your work and your vision. Mona, a lot of times, whenever I'm talking to artists, I like for the artists to be able to introduce themselves uh, with a hypothetical, which is uh, if you're at a dinner party and someone has never seen your work, how do you describe to, to uh, the unknowing audience what your work consists of and what it looks like? Well, you know, <clears throat> I think that's one of the hardest questions because. Whenever you do nudes, it's hard to describe your work as such because there's such a preconceived idea of that. So someone asking me that question on a dinner party, I usually uh, I usually go around it. I just usually say, hi, my name is Mona Kuhn. I'm a fine art photographer. Uh, and then they might ask, what, what, what kind of work do you do? And then I just usually try to say people or figurative. One of my earlier podcast guests... Uh, was an author named Jennifer Higgy, and she has a book uh, about female self-portraiture. And a lot of what she talks about is the male gaze versus the female gaze, right? And maybe you could talk to how, yes, you're photographing nudes, but how maybe your nudes don't necessarily look like the nudes of a photographer that may be stimulated by his male gaze. How do your photographs differ? Well, when I got into the arts in general, I got into the arts because I liked the idea of timeless. I I remember being really young, like in my teenager years, and I grew up in Brazil. Uh, My mother was very social. She would, um, you know, uh, she wouldn't work, but she would. She was very active in, in in doing a lot of social things, and. I w- and at, when I was a teenager, she would invite me to come with her. And I actually didn't want it. I was more of a shy teenager, and I wanted to be by myself. And I would often ask her if she could just drop me off by a museum and come pick me up four hours later. And in being at the museum uh, at the time, this is in, in the 80s, it was very empty. Uh, and in being empty, I would have this very kind of quiet and calm um relationship with the art that was displayed and every once in a while I would have this what I like to call it a mini levitation and to me as a teenager I was like why is it that why is it that I feel a pull towards this work and not to the other one and what is this mystery so I realized that there is something that is still communicating from someone that did a painting let's just say 300 years ago and then this young person in front of it that I barely knew anything about, you know, art history or too much. I, 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 I was just a teenager, uh, yet I was able to feel it. So my first introduction to the art was about crossing this element of time. When I got into photography, I realized that it's a fast medium. I like that. Um, I got into photography in my 20s. I... I felt at the time that I wasted a little bit of time. I didn't start studying art in in high school, so I felt that I was already too old to jump into it. So I wanted to jump into it quick and fast, and photography was quick and fast. But at the same time, I had the reason I fell in love with the art was because of the element of time or timeless. So I wanted to bring that to my photography, and I wanted to somehow stop time, right? Because when I first got into photography, it was about fashion or it was National Geographic or it was the magazines. 
And it was everything that, you know, within a month is gone uh, because another issue is in the newsstand. So I ended up understanding that what I wanted to photograph was the nude because of my first fascination with the element of time. And the nude to me was a way of uh, bringing it all together and stopping time. Uh, and it was a way for me not to have differences between people. Like there is no status symbols. There is, uh, it, it's very egalitarian. Like there is no, you, you cannot really tell. It's like if the human being is the presence and maybe that image could have been taken uh, 10 or 20 years before or after. There's no, in my work, the way I do it, there's no element of time in it. Now, that being said, I was always interested in the human, um, not only the human that makes art, but also the human in front of me collaborating with me. So nowadays, fast forward to your question, people, it, it, it seems to be a catch sentence now to talk about the male or the female gaze. To me, that doesn't matter. I happen to be inside of my body. I am a woman, so I naturally have a, female gaze, I cannot even tell you what a male gaze is because I, I'm not inside of a man's body. Um, so I can tell you that, I can tell you just my own personal experience. I look and respect the person in front of me as a human and I assume, but I cannot tell for sure, I assume that I'm, that all of my passion related to the art, which was a more quiet relationship with it, carries on into how I work and collaborate with the people. But that, if you want to call that a female gaze or not, I'm not sure that's your interpretation. Well, I think, you know, when I use the term female gaze, I think I'm coming at, at it from a perspective that uh, your your work is not overtly sexual, right? The, your, your subjects are nude, which I understand as the timelessness. There aren't those context clues to tell us when this image was captured. But the, your subjects, I don't think anyone feels like your subjects are being exploited. It's almost like we are witnessing you trying to make a connection with your subject, right? That there, there's a personal, something right. personal there. Well, I, I, do, I, I do think that my, um, you know, I am a lot more comfortable uh, representing the nude as more minimal, uh, more silent, my, my, the people in my work are maybe more pensive, and at times I, I, I even dare to say a little bit more monastic, where it is about the simplicity and our bareness. And in, in, in that I photograph, I am also like a bit of a minimal person on, on, on my way, way of life, and, and, and a bit more frugal as a person as well. So I think that I photograph people with the same quiet and pensive and introspective uh, elements that I have been carrying on with me for quite some time. Um, you know, you have females that are very loud and you have females that are very quiet. <laughs> and they're both females. So I think my gaze is more quiet. I, I, I like to say my... my my gaze, and, and yes, I do admit, I do gaze, I do look at people, I do look, I am a photographer, I am looking at everything in the world. I'm looking at a bus shelter the same way that I would be looking at someone crossing the street. Um, so, but I think that my, when it comes to conversation of gazing, I would just say that mine is more quiet. Is any part of that influenced by your time with the naturalist community in France? Like, do you feel like that experience with them helped? Yeah. Well, I, my, I think my relationship to just uh, being naked really started a lot earlier than, uh, than this place that I ended up going to in France. Uh, my... I was born in Brazil. My parents, both of them are German. And on the summer, in, on the winter time in Brazil, which is June, July, uh, once in a while, uh, once every two years or so, I would go to Germany to visit my grandparents. And we would spend, I don't know, 15 days with them. And my parents would then 
travel around or see their own, own, own friends. And we would stay with my sister and I would stay with my grandparents. And in Germany, usually the weather is, even though it's summer, is continues to be very gray. And we would stay with them and we would do coloring or whatever it is. And then once in a while, a little bit of sun would peek out. And they, both of my grandparents would run into the garden, take off all of their clothes, <laughs> get the closest newspaper that they had, and and lounge out in the ocean, uh, uh, lounge into the garden, look back into the house and say, Mona, Mona, come out in the sun, it's vitamin D, take off your clothes. So to me, nudity started with me and my grandparents and that idea that it is healthy or that idea that they, that, that it is so little that they get that when they do get, they want to have it e exposed all over sure. the body. Uh, so that was my introduction to the idea of nudity, which was a very familiar, very uh, in your backyard type of thing. And it also had this idea that they are older than me. So I'm already comfortable uh, with the body in itself, right? With, with all of the cycles of life. Um, and then when I started my studies and when I realized that the new to me is something that over and over again I feel very comfortable with, I feel very at easy with. Um, I also remember on, uh, I went first, I went to Ohio State, then I went, and then I took a few classes at the Art Institute in San mm -hmm. Francisco. And I remember being very frustrated photographing someone at the studio. And I remember thinking it's really, I remember thinking that that's not really what I want. I don't want someone, it's very unnatural for someone to come to the studio and, and this robe in front of the photographer and then pose in front of a camera and the photographer is all dressed and the person is disrobed and you have this kind of, you know, particular situation there. And I, I it felt always a little bit uh, not as legitimate as I would like it to be. I really wanted to go back to, you know, the, the, the backyard of my grandparents and in the 90s, mid-90s, I was really lucky to be introduced uh, to a naturist community in France, which is one of the oldest ones, so it's very family-based. Um, and when I entered the place for the first time, I saw a lot of older people in the nudes that come all the time. And it, it was exactly what I, in a way, was craving, but at the time, I wasn't really conscious of it. And I felt at home right away. And then I, the first person that I met there, his uh, grandmother uh, had a little, it started going to that place in the 50s. And he was the third generation in his family to be going. So he invited me the next day to have breakfast with him and his grandma. So there I am for the first time with a person that is about my age and the grandma, both are naked. I wasn't completely naked at the time because I was still getting used to the place. But I was already realizing that I love it and that I feel very much at home. Um, so to me, being introduced to the place has been a wonderful thing because it gave me the opportunity to have a more authentic relationship to the work itself, where I'm not trying to recreate it in a studio, but, I'm, but it's part of my life. And it has become part of my life. So it's like life and art coming together instead of trying to do art in the studio type of thing. So it sounds like you really want to get the subjects of your of your work to a place where they're comfortable being in, I think, what you've called a suit of skin, that feeling like they are clothed in their own skin. And at, at that right. moment of comfort, you can then open up a dialogue about capturing, you know, what's timeless in front of you. Right. I think that, I think, you know, the, the other thing that is interesting and, and not a lot of people know this is that usually photographers are always photographing and I like to think that between me and the subject I like to think that we're friends and we're people like I'm interested in them I'm interested in their lives I'm interested what happened to their parents or the grandparents or 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 or, or the, the the partners that they might have or are they fin graduating or are they starting to work or like I mean 80 percent of what goes on between them and me is about life and I think 20% of the time that we spend together 
I might pick up the camera or we might have an idea together and we'll start photographing. So I like to think that they would be friends, that our friendship is strong enough that we would be friends with or without the camera. So that's a little bit different. So what happened is we already have a foundation of trust, a foundation of knowing each other. So by the time we're photographing the nude, I have many conversations with them where they don't necessarily feel naked anymore. Like they feel confident and comfortable in their skin. They feel that it is, uh, they feel secure. Uh, they also know that um, I will communicate to them the images that I thought worked out for me. I always show to uh, my collaborators, I always show to them all the images. If there's anything that they really feel shouldn't be used, they are more than welcome to tell me. Very rarely there's a moment like that, but I like to photograph all of, I like to show them all of the photographs because that way I'm like creatively naked for them, right? So it's equal terms. I show the moments that I miss, that I made a mistake. Maybe they were posing so beautifully and I messed up on the exposure and then I have to say I'm sorry, right? So I show the moments that I fail and I'm also human and I'm just, that's all we are, both of, you know, both of us if I'm photographing someone. So I think that that's a very honest relationship that we have with each other. They also know that I will not show anything that maybe, maybe was, you know, there's, when you're working with with someone, you know, if you're photographing a an object, you can, you can do different angles and you go around it and that's what you photograph. But when you're photographing a person, it's not just the angles of composition, you're dealing with the psychology of the moment. And I think I'm really, really interested on, on, on that psychology as well. That's very much part of, I think, what that the mystery of the human being is very much what keeps me wanting to go back over and over and to create and to see if we can create something amazing again. Um, I always think that my best, my, my best image is the last one that I will ever be able to accomplish. You know, I hear you saying that you and your subjects are, are collaborators and it sounds like you're relying on them to help you, you know, with like a particular emotive state. I know that you you also do commercial work, and there are portraits that you're commissioned to do of of particular people. Is that part of your process there? Are you coming with a beforehand with with an idea on how you want to shoot a particular per, uh, person for these commercial projects, or is it once again getting to know them, opening a dialogue, trying to kind of get to some part of who they are, who they want to project themselves as being? On the personal work, it's very much about a certain state of mind, right? It's very much about the subjects and I, we we try to enter, so to speak, a, a little bit of a parallel reality. Or sometimes we use that expression that we're zoning into our creative world, right? You're zoning in or zoning out or something. So I think that uh, my main concern while we're having conversations and talking and so on is to use parts of parts of the life that we're sharing with each other into images that have some metaphor that might be more than just a portrait of the person on the personal work, right? Where someone comes into the gallery and they might project themselves into a portrait of someone else and they might remember something about themselves that is reflected on this image of someone else. So I think when I'm doing the personal work, I'm really aiming, not that I always get it right, uh, but I'm really trying to aim at an image that as much as it is an image of someone that I know, that that person, that that, that personality is opened up into metaphors where other people could project themselves into it. When it comes to the commercial work, um, many times what happens is that maybe our directors have, uh, are familiar with my work and they might say, hey, I really like what you did there. Uh, but now, for example, um, for example, like a fashion brand like Bottega Veneta or Dior, 
they say, we like what you do on your personal work, but now can you do this with our clothes? And can we recreate some of that? Um, and in the case, it's a whole other side of me. I'm not trying to make to, to create my personal metaphors because they have in their forefront of their thoughts, they need they they have a list of things that they need. The clothes need to be looking a certain way. Like there's a, a there's a, a thousand requir requir requirements that come from the from like the account managers of on ad agencies or so, or from the the people dealing with with if it's like clothes or if it's jewelry or whatever it is, they have a ton of requirements that need to be fulfilled for them. So that's a commercial work. Then I get paid to get that uh, for them and to deliver that to them um, and, and, and to really make sure that all of those puzzle pieces that they need and my style come together. So in that sense, I think it's less, uh, it's less of an internal creativity, it's more of a external creativity, right? I'm solving problems for a client. It's different than on the commercial work. I am I'm going inside of my soul. I'm having a relationship with my soul, with my thoughts, with other people's ideas and how they want to project each other. And we really have a more, uh, really like a engage on more metaphysical conversations. So where where do you find your subjects? I'm like, I know like your your series Bordeaux, that that was kind of one community, and it was the the people in that community, if I remember right. But other series, are you casting models, or are these people? It comes across that you you're establishing some sort of rapport with these folks, so it's it's almost like, and right. uh, many of your subjects look like real people, right? And versus 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 somebody ordered out of a catalog, right? Right. So I think that's why I've been, uh, it's hard for me to say, the, the easiest thing is to call them the models from a photographer, but they're not models. That's why I keep saying collaborators. Uh, a lot of them don't, a lot of them enjoy that idea of being photographed, but they are, they haven't been photographed by professional photographers. There's a lot of people that are creative, maybe creatively minded and want to engage in a creative project and understand uh, my visual vocabulary, but they don't necessarily want to be modeling. Um, I think that there's your initial um, question about where do I find them. It depends on the series. I have um, when I, at the very beginning when I was uh, very active photographing at this nature's community in France, I was able to. Uh, have relationships with people there and then photograph them and they would refer me to someone else because they realized it was, they felt safe and, and there was an accountability and I would show them the work and, and it, it, they, they knew that the process could be trusted. Um, but I also have done work at, at, here in the US in the Mojave Desert, two different series at different moments. And for those, I, it was a, a little, more, um, I had to reach out more to, to, to people that wanted to engage. So I reached out. A lot of it is word of mouth uh, because I do want to have people that are not professional models. The, the thing, the, the, the difference is a professional model will give the same expression to 10 different photographers. And that's great if you're under pressure and when you have a commercial uh, job is great because that professional model knows exactly how the best expressions and, and, and positioning work and then, you know, makes the, the job of the photographer much easier. But on my personal work, I really want, um, I really prefer people that have not been necessarily that photographed because there's a certain, um, there's a certain authenticity there that that's what I think is important and it's part of the work um, that it doesn't that, that there is a certain um, element of being unique or at least the moment of being unique is not is not you know when they when they're looking towards the lens they're not looking towards the lens all knowing how to look at the lens 
and that to me that feels a lot more legitimate. Um, the work the work that I did in, in Bordeaux, the Bordeaux series that you mentioned, that work was um, I wanted to photograph a wider cross section of the of of the French um, population, so to speak. And I photographed um, in Bordeaux. Out in Bordeaux, you have the University of Bordeaux. So I was able to reach out to um, French, but Muslim French and Algerian French and and old, younger or older. So there was a there was a, a bit more of a range there that I wanted to encompass. So I think that was a little bit more um, how I got into that that series. I, I feel like I've heard you talk before about one of your earlier aha moments as as a photography student was this realization about it really all kind of boiling down to shadows. Um, and but you know when I look at your work, you know your use of contrast is so subtle. That, I mean, I think a right. lot of photographers in in this generation, especially maybe people that are new to photography are really drawn to high contrast, high saturation, but there's something about your subtle use of value that your, your um, you know, the, the word quiet keeps coming up, but the, your, your use, yeah. your, your palette, it can be differentiated from other photographers just in, in my mind based on that subtle use of value. Is that, am, am, I, am I right or wrong there? <laughs> Oh, you're absolutely right, and I do appreciate that you see it, that you perceive it, um, because I think it was intended to be perceived e either knowingly or or uh, subconsciously. But the let me just take a step back. Uh, when I talk about uh, the shadow and my relationship to photography, is really it's it's a different take. Uh, I I think what you're referring to is when I mentioned my realization that. Um, I think I was in one of my first um, classes printing in the in the dark room or so. I, I went outside with the print to show to the teacher because you, you want to see sometimes with the daylight. And and I asked, oh, is, is this good or not good? And then the teacher at the time uh, mentioned probably that I have to redo it. But in any case, at the moment when the person, when the teacher went back into the into the dark room, and I was standing there for the first time. I realized that I am a, a being, and which you know it goes to everyone that you are a being, and that you cast a shadow, and that that shadow will always be there, and while you are alive, and 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 that realization is more of an existential realization, right? And the fact that. It's not just that I. It's not just that I am a human being because my brain is telling me or, or allowing me to make that conclusion. But the but if nothing else, the fact that I have a shadow uh, proves the point in a way that I do exist physically there. So that to me was more of a conscientization of of saying I'm really really interested on the human on the figure. But, but also on our presence of what are we doing during the lifetime that we are on planet Earth. I mean, I know it, it kind of gets a little esoteric, but it's kind of true. I do think about those things. No other planet out there we would be able to live, right? So this is the only planet in the entire solar system, possibly our galaxy, where there is, that, that is so beautiful, that is so conducive for me to just stand there and look at my shadow. And so... So that, to me, is, is a huge existential uh, seed of my work. But then, but then uh, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah. So then, so then the, the, the values and the contrast in my work itself, um, that I don't bring so much right away. I don't like the high contrast. I do like a lot of nuances. I like darker tonalities at times because it helps uh, it helps me hide the nude in a way so it's not so overt or gratuitous presented to the to the in in the image uh, so I have used shadow to help disguise a bit or make it more mysterious 
but uh, but with a lot of nuance and with a lot of um, a little softer palette. It's true. One of the first things that I do when when I am photographing is to lower the contrast. That's the first thing I do. You know, I, earlier in our conversation, you, you talked about how one of the things that attracted you to photography was how it's, it's quick. But taking the image is quick. That doesn't mean that editing is a quick process, right? right. <laughs> so can, can you tell me a little bit about what the process and maybe mentally what you go through on the back end of these shoots to really figure out what's working and what isn't? Yeah, so um, I did fall in love with photography because it's fast and you, all, you have that, I think with most of the photographers, you have that moment that is very much the same to all of us where you're in the dark room and you see that image coming out from the developer on the, you know, on the developing tray and it's just like developed in front of you and suddenly it's all there and you, you just cannot believe it happened, right? It, it, it is fast in the sense that for me to paint that image, it would take me at least two weeks and in the dark room, that image just popped up like that on the on the developing tray so that part of photography is very exciting because then you would go back over and over again and try different things and 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 the whole the whole nature of photography is a fast medium but inside the fast medium you have a whole range of things that happen like for example it takes i get inspired by spending time with people and that is not fast the, the clicking of the shutter when I do know what to do is fast. And then the editing is very slow again. So the editing part, it takes me, if I'm working on a series and let's just say I did a lot of, I photographed for a whole month and I'm looking at all these images, it takes me then six to eight months for me to decide what images I think are working out best for what I'm trying to say because there is a lot of things because photography is so immediate it's very very hard for me to separate at first an image that is a great image of someone I care about versus an image that has metaphorical potential and that I would like to be part of my visual vocabulary so those two things are, are, are it's hard for me when I just come back from the photo shoot I just came back from seeing people that I care about. So I like all of the images. It's impossible for me to choose one. So I do need a little bit of time to separate myself from the people that I just photographed and to have a, a little bit more of a, uh, a, a cold decision on what is the image that is in line with what I'm trying to say. Um, many times I because I show all the images to the people I photograph, sometimes they choose, I always, I always give them prints, and sometimes they choose the image that they might look the best, or probably many times they like an image that is the standard sexiness, they, they think that maybe the light made them look so amazing on that one, and that one looks hot, or whatever it is, and that is good for them, and I give them those prints, but then for me, I end up choosing the quiet ones, and it's really funny because I always, I, I also only get the permission, I only ha ask them for permission to use the work after they have seen the proof. So at the very end, they choose some for them, I choose maybe one or two for me, and I say, it is, so at the very end I say, would you give me permission to actually use this image in a gallery, exhibitions, or, or a book? And they're like, really? That one is so quiet and calm. And I said, exactly. <laughs> that is the one that to me makes more sense. Um, so it's really interesting. So you go through all this variation and, and then, so then the editing is very, very slow. But once I do have the, you know, the editing all together, not just the individual shoots, but how the whole series, how it comes together almost as if it would be a novel, right? So the individual images suddenly become sentences and becomes paragraphs, and then suddenly you feel that it is complete. Um, then 
then it takes time as well showing that to the galleries or showing that uh, to the publishers. So it kind of has a, it kind of goes through a whole myriad of levels of speed uh, through the process. So is that a process that you do mainly alone? I mean, is it, I mean, that six to eight months, is that really like this quiet meditative time for you? Or do, do you have another set of eyes that you're bouncing things off of? Yeah. Yeah. So first what I do, I have uh, in my, in, in my uh, studio, I don't really have a studio because it's the, pl- I photograph outside. Uh, I like to be out um, on location, but in my workspace, so to speak, I, I put all of the images, I have them all printed on small prints. Uh, nowadays, photography, you can do the editing um, digitally uh, on your monitor, but when you do that on the monitor on your computer, you, you may be able to see five, five to 10 images at a time. I like to see 500 at a time. So I actually ask the lab to make small prints and I put them on a, on a cork board all over and I see them every day and I cannot be every day um, just thinking about that, right? Because we are, you know, everyone's reality is different. I have a, a thousand other things and I work on multiple projects. I have a family, the phone is ringing, the galleries need something. So, so there's all these things happening, but in the background, I have all of those images there. And every time I pass by, or every day in the morning that I arrive, I take a look at it once again, and I then take down images that I think were really interesting when I first looked at it, but the magic is gone within a short amount of time. So it feels like that they were, some images you think it's a total winner and it's amazing, but after a month you're like, okay, I'm kind of tired of looking at it. It has a a short, short-lived uh, relationship to that image, and then some other images that I was completely ignoring, did not even really pay attention. The, the they suddenly become, they suddenly start showing up more in that crazy mess on the wall. So, I do the editing by putting all of it up, and then I just take, you know, one to five images down a day. And then eventually, you start seeing, uh, you start rearranging them, right? Because eventually, you start having empty, empty areas in between them. And so you start rearranging, start with those that have survived, so to speak. I start putting them next to each other and see if I can actually create sentences. Because they all come from different photo shoots. But then I see how do they work with each other, next to each other? What, what else does it communicate? Invariably, when you put images next to each other, if I'm thinking, for example, a book sequencing, right? So when I'm thinking about a sequencing, a lot of times there's a lot, of the, the, I think our brain, even if we don't want to, between one image and another, it will add information in between. So, I try to understand what is it that it's communicating that someone else could ha- could have the same conclusion that I had when I saw those next to each other. You see, that's when it becomes, that's when it starts becoming a little bit more magic and it's not so much just the work of a 2D flat image, but it's also involves the person looking sure. at it. Well, I think you and I both come from a generation where uh, bands used to make, you know, albums instead of singles, right? Right. And right. Hey, well, exactly. Exactly. Now, nowadays we have a problem, right? Because nowadays, like if you go with the albums, nowadays I, uh, I hear it in my workspace, I listen to Spotify. So with Spotify, it's play, it's already a ready-made whatever list that it's some kind of mood or some kind of you know playlist that that he puts together. I don't even remember the name of the artist, right? It's it's like so crazy because in the past I would have my LP that I love that I would like clean before I put on the 
on the player. Like there was a whole procedure. There, there was a whole procedure, and you know exactly. You have the side A, the side B, and and there was an intention of the artist. There was the first, second, and third track. There was a rhythm between the tracks, right? You would not put the best song on the first one. You would put on 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 the third track. So I think that you're right to say uh, that that's a different generation because I think that I still like that idea of creating a body of work. And I like that idea of having a certain sequencing from beginning to the end. Um, and I, I do leave room for interpretation because I think that that in a way adds an element of time where it lives longer because there is room for to be interpreted. Um, but I like, I like that it's a complete body of work, not just a chop chop here and there. So uh, I understand that you are uh, getting an award soon from the Los Angeles uh, Center of Photography, the Stiglitz Award. Congratulations is in, in order there, and I think there's there's a gala coming up soon, honoring you, right? And right. So. Um, yes. So congratulations! I, you know, and I know that you you recently had the mid career retrospective works. I think we're roughly the same age, and that it feels way too young for people to be using the word retrospective. You know? Yeah, I totally <laughs> agree with you. I don't know how that happened. So, but um, I, you know, Mona, I've I've really uh, enjoyed our conversation today, and you. I feel like you're the type of person that is just, um, and I can imagine what it's like being on a shoot with you because you, uh, you're, you're so affable and open and I, you know, I really appreciate you being willing to take time to talk about your process and your work today. And, yeah. uh, if folks wanted to, to keep an eye on your work and upcoming, you know, what, how, how can yeah. people keep track of you right now? Is the website the best? So. I think the 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 easiest way I think nowadays I do have a website with a lot of information and and a little bit more uh, a deeper information uh, on the website. But I have to tell you that I have been using Instagram for the for the things that are happening at the moment, this week or next week. And then it turned out that if you scroll down, you have a whole journal of what's going on, which I find to be not just on my Instagram, but when I'm looking at other artists or, or whatever it is that I'm researching, I find that to be really interesting because it's more immediate and you get to feel almost closer to that person that you want to understand, you know, that, that, that you want to know what's going on in their life. So I would say if people want to see what's happening, the Instagram, uh, it's hashtag Mona Kun Studio. Um, that one is a good way to follow. Um, you know, he, 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 you addressed an interesting uh, uh, subject that I'm in my 50s. I just turned into the 50s, and it is too early to do a retrospective. When the publisher, Tenton Hudson, came to me and he said, oh, you should do a retrospective, I said, there is no way that I'm going to be doing a retrospective right now. And then he said, well, would you do it if we would think slightly differently about it. And I said, what is this slightly differently? <laughs> he said, well, wh what about you're very prolific, you, you like what you do, you do a lot. Why don't you wrap up maybe the, 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 first, the, the first segment of your life? Why don't you do a compilation of what you have done so far? Um, and I said, well, that's a good thing. It is nice. It, the, the work has been done. It has been published as monograph by Steidel and then Thames and Hudson uh, did the, the retrospective book. The interesting thing about the retrospective or the mid-career compilation or so, um, the interesting thing about it is that most of the times you would imagine that, uh, you know, an artist go back into the archives and, and, and does a potpourri of things, like repackage the previous work. And that's exactly what I didn't want to happen. And in a way, when the pandemic hit uh, in March 2020. It was at the very beginning when I was just starting to work on, on this book. And it was interesting for me to see that I had a lot more time to look at my work. I had a lot of more time to actually make decisions about things that I wanted to 
published in the past that didn't get to be included on the first book about that series. So it gave it gave me a chance to revisit the work and and in a way um, take out the sequence of the previous work and in a way rethink and resequence it. So. I was able to really add a lot there. And then working with the writers was also very interesting. A lot of times, everyone is so busy, they write a text, and, and you're grateful for it, but you didn't have much time to really connect with the writer. And during the pandemic, I had one of the nicest conversations with all of the writers that contributed to the book. So I think that I was lucky to be able to do a book that is, there has to be, there has to have depth to be interesting. I was somehow able to do it during the pandemic. So that was very um, lucky. I have to say that during the pandemic, of course, like everyone else, I always thought that the phone is going to ring and the publisher is going to say that the project is canceled. So you go through these moments, of course. Um, but, but you know, you, you try to ignore the, those kind of calls. But the, but the, the Stieglitz Awards, um, I'm very, very honored. And um, and I think I, when I was talking to Julia Dean um, at the Los Angeles Center of Photography, one of the things I, I mentioned to her, I said, Julia, I'm too young for this. You have so many amazing people. Are you sure you're not making a mistake giving this to me? I just asked her. And then she said, Mona, absolutely not. It's not just about... Uh, the age of a person, but it's really, and everything that they have accomplished, but it's really about someone that is engaged with the community and giving back to the community. And we think you're a really good example of that. Like I did, I'm very interested in people. So it's not just about what I'm doing and how I bring them into my work, but in all elements of my life, I, I want to go to studio visits and, and look at other artists' works. I, I I'm excited about that. I, I, you know, so um, there was a moment. Th there were some years that I was curate, bringing bringing other artists' work into billboards in Los Angeles. Um, so and, and it was really exciting for me to engage with the with the art scene in LA and to see, like you mentioned, how do you how do you find out what Mona Kuhn is doing? And I was trying to find out what everyone else is doing. So is, is curation something that you think you might want to do more of? I had a chance. I always liked, uh, I always liked the art, the broad, broader idea of the art. Um, and I really like to celebrate anyone's um, in, uh, creativity. I think that creativity is something, I, I consider that to be something fragile. I think that a lot of times, you might be discouraged or pushed over or whatever it is. So I like to celebrate everyone's attempt with their own creativity. And, um, and I think pe when people are curating, from what I understand by talking to friends of mine that are curator, they're really there to foster that, to foster that in the artist. So I like that. Eventually, it would be nice. But then again, I'm not going to have a PhD in, in art history now. Yeah, so it wouldn't be an official route like that. But I have had the chance uh, here and there to, to, to do a little bit, like the billboard project in Los Angeles with 45 different billboards all over LA. Or I did um, some um, gallery exhibitions in New York one or two times uh, bringing together 30 different artists from different countries so but those those moments are rare but when they do come up i do engage right away because i enjoy that well again Mona, i i really appreciate your time i know you described the uh the hustle and bustle of your day and i'm you know i'm appreciative that you're willing to to carve out some time to to have this discussion i uh, just want to pass on my congratulations to you on the this uh, this award and in your mid-career uh, best of album that you've uh, compiled <laughs> so well i i am the one lucky of having your attention right. well you know i again i really appreciate it and Now, the news. 
the Mexican government is working to put a halt to an upcoming sale of pre-Columbian artifacts in Germany. More than 70 artifacts are scheduled for auction this week by Munich-based art dealer Gerhard Hirsch Nachfolger. Mexican Secretary of Culture Alejandro Frostro sent a letter to the art dealer this week imploring a stop to the sale and a return of the works in question. In her letter, Secretary Frostro explains that the National Institute of Archaeology and History had deemed the pieces national and cultural treasures that belong to the people of Mexico. The letter also referenced a 1934 Mexican law which prohibits the export of Mexican objects of archaeological importance and emphasized the government's intent to recover any cultural treasures that come up for auction around the world. The Culture Secretary also called on Mexico's Attorney General and Ministry of Foreign Affairs to get involved, and just this week, the Mexican ambassador to Germany personally visited the art dealer in hopes of putting a stop to the sale. Well, these tactics worked to stop a similar sale earlier this month in Rome, but to this point, the German art dealer has no plans to back down. In the midst of the ongoing debate of how museums should be able to deaccession works to help cover their cost, it was announced this week that New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art is selling more than 200 photographs and prints from its collection to make up for a budget shortfall resulting from the decreased attendance and giving during the global COVID crisis. The works will be spread out across three different cells at Christie's, the first of which is taking place later this week. The specific pieces include a large number of Civil War photographs, as well as works by the likes of Roy Lichtenstein and Frank Stella. The multiple cells are expected to bring in up to $1.4 million. As we've discussed here before, deaccessioning is a hot-button issue in the museum world and one that's frowned upon if not done conscientiously. Well, Met Director Max Hollinen assured the press this week that the museum is being very careful with the process and only chose works that are duplicates of works in the museum's collection. At the center of determining what's right and wrong with the transaction is the Association of Art Museum Directors. Under normal circumstances, their policies would forbid such a sale to raise funds to cover costs. The association typically only deems deaccessioning viable if selling lesser works to reinvest in acquiring greater works. However, the pandemic has created an opportunity. The AAMD is allowing members to tastefully and thoughtfully sell works to help cover costs during this unprecedented time. The policy change is in place until April of 2022, but as we have all grown accustomed to during these days, Dates and details are subject to change. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.